Okay, welcome back. Um, I'm going to try uh, one a couple of these segments here, uh, minus the, the actual video of me. Um, you've all got a chance to be able to see me and hopefully um, can connect a person now with the voice. Um, we're going to talk this week about assessing knowledge and deeper understanding. And what I'm going to talk about uh, in large part is uh, different question types that we can use. I'm uh, also going to talk about uh, some of the different uh, the structures of those question types, and then uh, discuss some of the uh, positive and uh, negative kind of uh, characteristics of different strategies of assessing uh, students. So let's start out with a, a type that's probably pretty familiar. Multiple choice items or selected response. These items are uh, typically found um, in a format where we have a stem that can be a direct question or it can be an incomplete statement and then we're provided with different kinds of alternatives one of those is the correct or the best answer and the other is um, what are called distractors or foils or decoys so there are a lot of different uses for multiple choice questions one is uh, to look at knowledge outcomes. Um, multiple choice is a good way, or selected response is a good way to get at things like terminology, facts, basic principles, methods and procedures, and then also we can get at understanding and application. And you get a chance to see this a bit on the first exam. Not very many of those questions were at the knowledge level. Uh, most of them were at the comprehension application level. and. Um, We'll break out and we'll take a look at some of those um, questions that were on that first exam uh, as some of the examples for those. But we can get at things like identifying the application of facts and principles. We can have students or um, individuals interpret cause and effect relationships. And we can take a look at justifying methods and procedures. There are a lot of different limitations and advantages um, for multiple choice questions. And um, some of the advantages are that we can go anywhere from very simple to moderately complex uh, learning outcomes. And another real advantage is that they're highly structured and they're clear tasks. Now, the second point here I think we need to underscore. And the reason that I, I think that you need to underscore this is if we think about our discussion, um, board, the, the last one that we just finished up, uh, where you all talked about the uh, relative advantages and disadvantages of spelling out what kinds of things needed to be measured for teachers. One of the things that was discussed at length was the issue of, of fairness and equity for students. Um, a couple of the administrators commented, and I thought they were brilliant comments, where they would say, you know, as a teacher, they felt that they needed to have the um, latitude and the authority to teach as they saw fit, that it was part of the art of teaching. But as an administrator, they had a different view of the, of the picture. And they would have multiple teachers, each one doing something really quite different. And so depending on the luck of the draw, as a student went into a set of classes, uh, in large part would determine the kind of grade that they would get and what they would be measured on even. So multiple choice selected response items, although they don't necessarily get at all the kinds of things we want, they do give us um, a common set of outcomes and they're not the only thing that can do this, but they are one type. Another good thing is that we can um, measure a broad sample of achievement and uh, I think, you know, for example, that first exam, there's certainly some construct underrepresentation with certain questions, which is why the selected response is only worth a third of your first exam grade. But it was able to get at a lot of different kinds of material. And my guess is that those things that you studied more, you probably did better at, and the things that you studied less, um, you probably did uh, somewhat, um, somewhat less well. Um, on those questions. So it's um, 
it's great for being able to get at a lot of different kinds of information, but it's generally not at a terribly deep level. Um, you can go more than just a surface level, but it's not, uh, it's not the kind of in-depth analysis that you would expect, say, an extended essay or, for example, the discussion prompts that people are offering. Uh, and, and as you review those, you can see, you know, real differences in the way that people respond and the amount of thought that they put into it and um, the degree to which they've invested themselves and their time. So we can't get at those things with multiple choice questions, uh, but we can get at some moderately complex kinds of learning outcomes. Uh, point number four is that these are relatively free from response sets. And what I mean by that is, uh, when you ask an open-ended question and you say, uh, you know, what were the what was the primary cause of the Civil War? You're going to get more than one answer, and probably more than one of them is correct. But then you wind up in the situation where you not only have multiple answers that you anticipated, but you also have answers that are close but not quite. And so, what do you do with those? Do you give them partial credit? Do you give them no credit? Um, and so at some point, the teacher's got to make some kind of a judgment call, and what happens is uh, this is where reliability problems start to come into play. Well, that's sort of correct. I'm going to give you some credit, but, you know, I don't know. It's I'm not really sure. So response sets are the entire set of responses that you get for a particular question. Multiple choice questions tend to be free from response sets. There's a right answer. Point number five. So point number five, incorrect alternatives can provide us with diagnostic information. I think this is particularly um, uh, well suited for things like mathematics exams, where let's, let's say that we have a question where um, a simple question like 7 plus 3 equals 10. And so we all know, of course, that the answer is, um, is 10. And so maybe that's our option A. Now, if we think about uh, other kinds of diagnostic information that might help us, if we had uh, 7 plus 3 and then one of, our, uh, one of our alternatives or distractors was 4, that would tell us something important, wouldn't it? If a student selects 4 and they're not just picking it randomly, um, instead of adding 7 plus 3, they've subtracted 3 from 7 and they've wound up with 4. So we can get um, some diagnostic information from the incorrect responses that students provide. Six, scoring is easy, objective, and reliable. Well, when you have a selected response item and there truly is one correct answer, um, it's much easier to, uh, to score this item than it is, say, um, a constructed response or an essay item where you have response sets and you have interpretation and you have differences in writing and one of the things that is um, is great about selected response is that you can feel like everyone got the same question and there are some issues we can talk about those in a moment but everyone got the same question you you select the right answer you get the you get the question right you don't select the right answer you get the question wrong you don't have the influence of um, the person that's marking it you don't have the differences in writing style um, there are some problems. We'll talk about those in a moment. Compared to a short answer question, these tend to be uh, less likely to be vague or ambiguous. Um, it's um, when you ask for a short answer, there, again, we have this issue of response sets. We have this issue of trying to fill out uh, what it is that we think that teacher wants. So the primary cause of the Civil War was fill in the blank. and what is the what's a student going to fill in for that? Well, there might be a, a variety of different correct answers, but when we set out four different economic uh, reasons for the Civil War, then the students prompted to select the economic reason that they believe is most related to the cause of the Civil War. If we set out four social reasons, then the student is going to be oriented toward the social reason perhaps that was emphasized most as the cause or one of the causes of the Civil War. Um, when you ask this as just an open response question, then 
students might pick social reasons, or they might, might pick economic reasons, or they might make, pick some other kind of political reasons. And any one of those might be correct. Um, this allows you to focus in more narrowly on uh, specific kinds of content, specific kinds of learning outcomes. The next one is um, it's more reliable than true-false. Of course, a true-false question, there's a 50-50 chance of getting the item correct, uh, even if um, you're just guessing. So uh, generally, we have uh, three or four responses, uh, maybe as many as five responses on a selected response item. Uh, it makes it uh, improbable that if you're going to guess, you're not going to do terribly well. Compared to a matching items, um, which are good item sets um, where you have you know five different items and then you have maybe uh, you know uh, ten different terms that you want to match those two. In a matching set, you really need to have homogeneous material. Um, you, you can't have one item that's a person, one item that's a place, one item that's a time, and uh, expect that those are really good distinct questions because they're already categorically. Um, delineated for the student. So we don't have to have this sort of homogenous material. We can go from one topic to another to another to another. However, uh, despite a lot of positive characteristics of multiple choice items, there are a lot of um, uh, limitations as well. The first one is that it's an extremely time-consuming task to construct good items. But you do get higher quality for the for the greater amount of time that you spend um, constructing items, and it's particularly difficult to construct good um, comprehension and application level items. It's often quite difficult to find plausible distractors, and we've all probably either written or taken a test where one of the distractors was something like Mickey Mouse as you know option D. Essentially, somebody ran out of um, Ideas. So, you know, who was the first president of the United States? George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Benjamin Franklin, or Mickey Mouse? Now, that's maybe not a great example in that we probably could come up with an easy fourth plausible distractor. But uh, oftentimes we, we can't, and so we put in things that are silly or are, um, um, you know, nonsensical uh, or are clearly wrong. Those aren't really distractors. You might as well have just left it at three items. In fact, that would have been superior. If you're trying to inject humor in the test, um, you know that there might be some uh, kind of rationale or plausible, uh, you know, uh, support for doing that. Uh, but it's not generally perceived to be a, a good thing. Um, if you're making a joke of kind of your own assessment, um, I, I guess it just depends on the light in which you're doing it. But I would caution people not to overuse that strategy. It's ineffective for measuring some kinds of problem solving. Certainly, it's not good for, um, you know, looking at how people organize and express their ideas. Um, it's not good for synthesis. It's not good for evaluation. Um, you can get at things as high as analysis, um, certainly comprehension, certainly application. But when you're trying to get at the ability of students to synthesize material and information, you really can't get at this with a multiple choice question, which I'm sure is quite obvious to most most students. It's quite abstracted from factors in natural settings. Uh, multiple choice items, you know, it's not writing an essay. It's not producing something real. Of course, writing an essay isn't necessarily producing something real either. but. Uh, multiple choice questions are not something that we face in everyday life unless we happen to be maybe a game show host. Um, we don't sit around saying, well, is the option A or B or C or D? Uh, rather, we're having to problem solve and figure out what the uh, right answer or the best answer to an issue or, or a problem that we're facing is. Scores, and the last item here, item five under limitations on this page, is that scores can be, and I would actually cross out can be, and I would change that to are influenced by reading ability. This is, in my mind, this is the primary problem with multiple choice items. Of course, it's the primary problem with any other kind of item as well, is reading and writing ability are um, the great equalizers of assessment. Um, but in particular, for multiple choice items, um, reading ability, reading comprehension, is 
is a huge predictor of how well someone's going to do. They could be quite knowledgeable, but if they can't determine from the item uh, what it is that they're supposed to be uh, recalling or what it is that they're supposed to be producing, they're not going to get that item right. Now, I know that seems obvious, but there are subtle differences across students in how well they're able to read. And this isn't necessarily evidenced by their ability to um, to uh, decode. In other words, you may have a student read or you may hear a student reading and they sound like they read just fine. Uh, it's not until you sort of look under the hood, if you will, and you realize that their comprehension, their understanding of the complex relationships between terms and phrases and sentences and paragraphs is limited. And as a result, um, that that comes through uh, much more clearly in their ability to answer a multiple choice test than does uh, anything else. So in fact, if we look at uh, something like a uh, problem solving test where um, there's, uh, we often see like, you know, basic computation tests in the math section, but then we also see something like word problems or problem solving. The primary uh, predictor of how well someone's going to do on the word problem a section of a math test is not their math skills, it's their reading skills. And that, that's absolutely the case. So scores are influenced by reading ability and they are influenced to a large degree. So, what is your um, objective? Well, you have to have a clearly stated problem, you have to have plausible distractors, and there can't be any clues. The idea is that you want to know can the student, all other things being equal in terms of their reading ability, can the student discern what the right answer is because they understand the problem and they understand how to apply the correct information to that problem. This is not always so easy. And we, we just as often fail as we succeed in the writing of this, just as students fail and succeed in the taking of it. Okay, So, here are some examples. We can ask the student to apply a rule or a principle. Statistical tests cannot show which one of the following. So, option A, whether two sets of scores are significantly different, why two sets of scores are different, how closely related are two sets of scores. So, which one of these can a statistical test not show? Well, the option A asks the student to understand that whether two sets of scores are significantly different. Well, significantly is a key term in um, statistics, and it stands for something quite specific. It's not just the word significantly. It is, there, it is implying statistical significance. And so, obviously, A is something that can be shown with a statistical test. Let's look down at C. How closely related are two sets of scores? How closely related is actually kind of simple words for correlated. How correlated are two sets of scores? We clearly can show that too. Why two sets of scores are different? Well, statistical tests don't show this. And so, for someone who really knows nothing about statistics, this is uh, um, an example of asking somebody to apply a rule or a principle or a general definition about something and then look for non-examples of it. Here's another one. We can show cause and effect. What is likely to happen to mortgage interest rates when interest, rate, when interest rates on savings go up? Are they likely to increase? Are they likely to decrease? Are they not likely to change? Or is it unpredictable? So in this case, um, they have to understand what is the relationship between uh, savings interest rates and mortgage interest rates um, and then be able to apply that principle to one of these four options. So it's really getting at this underlying cause and effect relationship. Okay, so here are some suggestions for writing multiple choice questions. One, present a single clearly formulated problem. There are um, many cases where we can ask multiple questions all at the same time. We need to present a single problem um, to the student and then we need to use two simple clear language without irrelevant material. So if any of you are Car Talk fans you know that the 
the uh, click and clack like to obfuscate uh, their problems and add in unnecessary and irrelevant information that makes it more difficult to figure out what the real question is. That shouldn't be the case. Three, put as much of the wording of the item as possible into its stem. Why is this? Well, by putting more of the item in the stem as opposed to the um, different options, we're not asking the students to read as much language. It reduces the reading load of the item. So if you think about this, it makes logical sense. If the stem or the actual question part is longer and the answer options are shorter, it's much easier to scan across the differences for the different answer options than it is if the question is quite short but the answer options are each quite long. State it in a positive form whenever possible. And if you're not able to do that or you want to look for what is the exception to this rule, which is often a good um, question, make sure you highlight any negative wording like not or is um, except. Uh, we'll look at a couple of examples of that in a moment. Some more suggestions. For your distractors or your alternatives, make sure that they're all parallel and they're all grammatically consistent with the stem. Make sure that your intended answer is correct or is clearly best. And I've been guilty of this even in this class um, of creating a question where the intended answer was not any better than another answer um, or if you were to read into the stem slightly differently, it was actually wrong. It's not that easy to do is what I'm trying to get at. And so don't feel bad if you look at your own test and you need to make corrections. Three, avoid verbal, uh, verbal clues or verbal associations. And sometimes these verbal clues actually could lead a student to the wrong answer. Something that rhymes, for example, uh, or um, we might have uh, alliteration where the uh, structure of the question would lead one to believe that the correct answer began maybe with a certain letter uh, or uh, a verbal association in terms of the uh, gr grammar, um, in terms of, you know, if we have a singular stem and then we have three multiple or plural uh, responses and one singular response, um, it would seem that the singular response should go with the singular stem. In other words, you know, if we talk about one individual uh, and then there's three groups and one individual in the options, people are going to go for that one uh, individual and they're going to just ignore um, the actual content. They're going to just be focused on the structure of the question. Three, uh, excuse me, four, um, keep the relative length of the uh, options from becoming a clue. So, you know, uh, option A is, you know, is, is two or three words. Option B is two or three words. Option C is two or three words. Option D is like 12 words long. And typically students will go for the longest answer. Five, distractors need to be plausible and attractive to the uninformed. So if you don't understand the problem, what is it that you're likely to go for? That's what, you, excuse me, that's what you need to make sure your distractors are trying to do. To be appealing to someone that doesn't understand the nuances of um, the topic or the issue or the, the particular um, strategy, uh, concept, or whatever else it is that you might be testing. Six, minimize or eliminate the use of none of the above and all of the above. Okay, uh, This should be a relatively rare occurrence. And what it really is, is it's um, the, one of the reasons for this is that if you have uh, an all of the above option and a student realizes that two of the things are true, then all of the above must be true. Similarly, for none of the above, if they realize that any two of the options are not true, then none of the above must be the correct answer. So you, you're, you're in essence turning it into a uh, three uh, option answer as opposed to a four or five option answer, especially if you're using it in a five um, choice array. None of the above and all of the above really only test whether they can identify two things, not all of them. Seven is, of course, varying the position of your correct answer. So making C the right answer all the time, not a good strategy. So overall, what are some suggestions for selected response questions? Understanding items must have some 
um, but not too much novelty. What I mean by this is that you can't just regurgitate something that's used in class and ask it as a question on your test. If you do, even if you think you're assessing something complex, whether it's an essay or it's, uh, excuse me, whether it's a short answer or it's a selected response item, um, you may think that that's assessing things at a comprehension or an application or even an, uh, an analysis level. But if you've already used that, sp that specific example in your work with the students, it's no longer a high-level question. It's now actually a low-level question because it's regurgitation. It's just memory. So you have to have some, but not too much novelty. It shouldn't be so dissimilar that it, it fails to meet that face validity um, criteria that we talked about earlier, that it looks like the kind of test it is. That's important to students as they're taking a test. Second is don't use multiple choice items when other item types would be more appropriate. And um, so you, you can assess high order, higher order thinking. You can assess the ability to synthesize information. Um, don't try. So some ideas for good distractors. One, draw from students' most common errors. If you've been a teacher for a while, you probably have a pretty good idea of what these errors are. Those should be uh, embedded in your distractors. They give you diagnostic information, and they help you to determine who really does and who doesn't understand um, the information. Use important sounding words um, sometimes. So if you use technical language that's unrelated uh, to the actual question, um, you could look at this as obfuscation, but if it's in the response as opposed to the stem, um, I don't have a problem with it because what you're trying to do is appeal to somebody that uh, doesn't know and they're just guessing. They're looking for something that looks like it's right. <clears throat> Make sure that um, you use verbal associations with the stem. In other words, all of your items should uh, look like they really belong with the question. So when you read that item out loud to yourself, does it flow easily no matter which option you take? If they're awkward or they're stilted, um, that's often a tip to students that they're the wrong answer. Four, use textbook language. So use phrases and ideas, uh, even like passages from the uh, chapter tests and the sample tests that are given. Um, you might just lift phrases directly out of those to put into your tests. Try to think of what are the most likely misunderstandings, like option five. What are the things that students most often misunderstand, and that kind of relates to option one, what are the most common errors? Six, keep all of your alternatives parallel in form and grammatically consistent, as we already talked about. And then also make sure your alternatives are homogenous in content. So if you have one that's clearly different in content than the other three, that might be a tip that it's the right answer. And then finally, um, keep alternatives similar in length, vocabulary, complexity, and structure. Okay. So how do you know when to use these items? Well, when are multiple choice items more appropriate or less appropriate than some of the other kinds of item types, like, for example, short answer or true-false or matching or performance-based tasks? Well, let's take a look. Okay, so one of the comparisons uh, we could make is between multiple choice and true-false. Um, for example, uh, for true-false, um, we have just two possibilities for students to provide, uh, whereas multiple choice, we have several. So uh, multiple choice questions require students to make more complex distinctions, perhaps, than if each uh, item were written as a true-false statement. Um, so instead of choosing between just two options, an example, uh, a, which is uh, follows here, um, there are more options and there's less chance of guessing correctly in, a, in example B. So let's take a look. So A, true false, the capital of Kentucky is Louisville. B, which city is the capital of Kentucky? Oh, now we have Lexington, which we know is uh, a good option. Uh, Frankfurt, well, that seems like it might be. Louisville, is that in Kentucky? Um, and so we find that this is a much more difficult question than just simply saying uh, the capital of Kentucky is Louisville. And so we have a 50-50 chance of um, getting that correct. Um, if we really don't know the answer here, we have a 1 in 4 chance. 
So here's a variation. One variation of a multiple choice question uh, is where we have um, a question that's posed as either yes or no, but then the reason is attached to the yes or no response. Okay, so in essence, we're saying true or false, this is, uh, and then why, essentially. So, for example, do students who study Spanish generally do better in language arts, or English, than students who study, who study Latin? So option A is yes, because they are more likely to see and hear Spanish words, or B, yes, because the Spanish language is so similar to ours, or C, no, because many of our words are derived from Latin words, or no, because the study of Latin requires more discipline. Oh, wow. Now we've taken a multiple choice question, or excuse me, a true and false question, and we've turned it into something far more uh, complex and challenging. We have to not only come up with true or false, but now why. Another variation on the multiple choice and true false question uh, is where we have um, a question posed that's really a true false question, but then we have a series of responses that are all related to that same issue. Uh, for example, look at the following item. Um, this item is structured like a multiple choice item, uh, but in actuality it's a whole series of true-false items uh, where they're forced choices. So which of the following are good assessment practices? Mark G beside each good practice, P beside each poor one. And so then as you can see, students have to um, uh, mark each of the following items. Uh, and so we can collect a lot of information um, about the single topic pretty quickly. The other thing that's good about this is that it keeps students uh, focused in a, a singular uh, content domain. So we're not jumping all over the place, but uh, it's kind of like uh, that organized response, um, organized response set uh, that we talked about for matching items. This is a, almost a similar structure to a matching item where we have multiple um, related items that are woven together. Some other notes and comments for you. Um, best answer items are probably the ones that uh, undo students the most. In other words, we're measuring understanding application and interpretation, and they're usually more difficult than correct answer items. Okay? For example, on the next slide, we ask a student to determine what is the most important consideration. This presupposes that your instruction has included activities in which uh, students are called upon uh, to develop skills of comparing and evaluating information. So uh, if we have students that have been instructed uh, for that particular purpose, uh, the question measures only knowledge. Now I referred to this earlier uh, where I said, like, you've got this great, this killer example in your class. But then you ask the same question on your test. You're not asking a high-level question anymore. You're asking a recall question. Uh, it's only a high-level question to students that happen to miss your lecture that day or miss your class that day and miss out on the example. So here's one of these best answer items. Which of the following was the most important consideration <clears throat> in locating cities during the frontier times in America? Good farmland? Access to waterways? Easy to defend against attacks by Indians? Moderate temperatures? So. This presupposes that students have had a certain contextual experience in your classroom. And you can see that depending on the teacher that they had, the correct answer here might change. So best answer items you need to remember are in fact contextual. And so when you use them, and you should use them, um, you've got to make sure that students understand that it's not what they think is the best answer, but it's what would be the best answer based on the information that they'd been given in your class. Some more notes and comments. Reading level and reading speed of students must be considered when you're constructing your items. If your language is too difficult or you have a lot of slow readers among the students, some of them are going to earn even lower scores because they don't finish rather than because they don't know the material. Each multiple choice question typically involves more reading than a true false, or a short answer, or a completion question. So keep this in mind as you think about how many you're asking. Even more notes and comments. Multiple choice questions may, uh, may not be as good for problem solving uh, in math or uh, as completion or short answer items. 
Um, but if students must take a standardized test in a multiple choice format, uh, the students need some experience with, with doing this. So um, one of the things that I hear from teachers on a fairly regular basis is uh, I, I don't really believe in multiple choice tests. I don't really want to use them. Uh, but I think it's a disservice to your students uh, because it's, it's, a, it's a skill, whether it's a life skill or it's just a survival skill through school, it's a skill that students need and they need to be proficient with. So by giving them practice in your classroom, you get diagnostic information not only about what the kids know, but you also get some diagnostic information about whether they understand how to uh, answer selected response items. Um, it, it may not be something at a, at a philosophical level that we agree we ought to be doing, uh, but it's in essence a, a uh, an element of test preparation. Um, so what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to divide this lecture right here. I'm going to stop it because it's uh, gotten to be um, fairly long and uh, I'm going to split this off into the constructed response as part two. So look forward to uh, finishing up with that piece.